Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth, I'm a marine biologist and welcome back to another day where we explore awesome coastal places and adventures for rock pooling and I'm very excited about today because today we are at Mumbles Pier. Mumbles Pier is one of those locations you should only really rock pool at super low tides because you can get out to all the awesome stuff and find some really weird things which is awesome and today is a super low tide so I am very excited. This is going to be awesome because not only are we going to be looking under the awesome rocks but we can also look at the life that is growing on Mumbles Pier which for someone who did their PhD in biofouling which is the study of sea life that grows on man-made things just like piers this is going to be a super geeky day for me and I am going to thoroughly enjoy it. I actually bumped into someone who recognised me from my channel which is awesome I think the name was Matt, hi Matt <laughs> if that was you, who said that there was a sponge that only grew here in one other location so that is a goal today to see if I can find that. I don't actually know what the sponge is I'm just gonna record loads of sponges and fingers crossed that it's the right one. My other thing that I want to catch today or look at is a crinoid I've seen a, which is a feather star which is beautiful long armed wiggly thing um, and I found them here I recorded them on my GoPro and actually like years and years ago it was one of the first videos I put up on my YouTube channel I would love to get a much better video with my proper underwater camera now um, so yeah let's go explore before we get into this video properly, I just want to emphasize how incredible the tides are here. Swansea has the second largest tidal range in the entire world. And just look how much, when the tide goes out, you can get what is usually underwater. It's just meters upon meters. In fact, I can tell you the exact amount. It's 9.8 meters difference between high tide and low tide. So that is getting basically under 10 meters of water to see what lives right right under the sea it's just so incredible and you'll see from this video just how weird and wonderful this means the creatures that you can find at the bottom of mumbles pier are i can't believe that under just this rock i've seen three four species i've never seen before this absolutely chunky boy of a of a sea slug I have never seen a sea slug this big before. They are usually smaller than a fingernail. I was dumbfounded when I saw this for the first time. And I went back and looked it up. And apparently it's one of the most common species of sea slug that you can find in the UK. Where have these <laughs> fat little chunky things been hiding? You're such a good example of you can see the muscular foot underneath, the skirt that's around it. But they definitely lived up to their common name here because there's loads of them. They were absolutely everywhere. It was just amazing. And because they're so much bigger, you can really see that like um, their, their fluffy bum. They use those kind of gills at the end to get a lot of oxygen across uh, from the water into their bodies. Just knockout amazing. And the reason they must be so common here is that they feed on sponges and sponges are absolutely everywhere here. It's so big! It's the biggest sea slug I've ever seen, ever! I'm gonna make sure I put him down nice and gently. Then that crab with the long arms, I don't even know what type of species that is. Oh, a day where I find a new crab species is a glorious day indeed. Look at this little wardrobe out cute little spider. I mean, okay, no, crab. Ah, see, this is where you get confusing because it's actually a scorpion spider crab, which is an awesome name. And you can see it is a bit spidery and it's it's got this, this sponge in it. So that's one of its identifying features if it's covered in all that crusty, spongy loveliness. I told you sponges are like, amazing here. They're even growing on the crab. Oh, that is so incredible. I'm going to put this absolutely gorgeous boy back now and then nice and gently turn the rock over. Oh my god, that's amazing! Oh, and the baby scallop. I've never seen a scallop before, not a wild one, and I'm pretty sure there's a baby scallop living there. Yes! I totally learned something new about scallops and that queen scallops um, can attach as juveniles by byssus threads which are the same things that mussels use to attach to things. I thought they just lived in sand and gravel so to find one on the bottom of the rock was just an amazing epic surprise. Another thing I hope to find and I mentioned earlier we actually managed to find a, uh, a feather star which is this little thing here. Not so impressive when it's not underwater and you can't see all its lovely featheriness but the water visibility today in the sea was like a millimetre. There's no way that you could see anything in that water it was so cloudy so I just 
watched from afar. Well, we can't not talk about Mumbles Pier. We are at Mumbles Pier and it is absolutely covered in sea life. Now, forgive me slightly, in a bit you are about to get a very geeky breakdown from someone who has spent years and years and years studying the sea creatures that grow on man-made things. But I just need a awesome time-lapse of all the crusty sea creatures to a bit of good music before we get to that. So, cue to that. There is just so much life here. Now you might think, surely sea creatures would prefer to live on a rocky shore and a bit something natural, something that isn't relatively new, like we've discovered and put metal into the sea, like on this pier. But actually, the reason that there is life on this and life on basically anything we put in the sea is that it is super competitive. There is so much more larvae spawning little young trying to find spots than there is space on rocky shores for them to settle. That's the reason rocky shores are so diverse. Every crack, every crevice, every under the rock, every top of the rock, everything has life on it because there is so much life out there to have settle on it and live. So when we put mammy things in the sea, exactly the same thing happens. They go, yes, there's a new bit of land for us to settle on. There are some differences in the type of species you find on man-made compared to natural shores. And that's what I found really fascinating. Why is that? What it is about the materials or the environment that's changing that? And that's what I studied during my like dissertation and masters all the way into PhD. I've spent years of my life kind of researching this and looking into this because I find it so fascinating. But no matter what you put in the sea, you are always going to get life on it. One of my favourite things to write in my thesis, well it wasn't my favourite because it was a bit frustrating, but when you're studying biofouling and have to write biofouling caused a problem itself to me, <laughs> it's quite funny. Lots of people try and put sensors in the sea to study things. It's interesting and good for us to know, you know, how much light is there in the sea at this time. What's the temperature? And particularly with light, I put a sensor in and after a couple of weeks it just goes dark like pitch black dark because it measures how much light is getting into the water. Now the world hasn't gone pitch black dark, not that I've noticed, but what that is is a barnacle or something settling on top of that light sensor because even on a tiny little plastic light sensor there will be a ton of sea life living on it. So having to write, I, have, I can't report past this point because of biofouling in a thesis that's like studying biofouling I find is so hilarious. But I just find all this fascinating and amazing. And this is a prime example of how life just finds a way to take over, to survive, to live, to thrive, and just create these whole ecosystems on things we put in the ocean, which is why we have to consider where we put stuff, why we put stuff in, what's gonna happen to it when we do put it in, which is what I studied for my PhD. I just love it here. As I'm walking around today, I'm having to be really careful of where I step. Firstly, it is a shore that there is a lot of more like jaggedy old metal and stuff that happens, tends to happen um, when you're closer to man-made things, but always be careful of kind of where you're stepping for stuff like that when you're out anyway. But also, and a much more exciting reason, is because there are hundreds of starfish. This was just so incredible and exciting to see. I don't think I've ever seen as many starfish in one place as I have here. I got just as excited on the shore, only to get back and see editing and realise I've recorded this whole bit in slow-mo, so <laughs> it's not the best experience having to watch yourself just do very excited expressions in slow motion anyway. <laughs> so I'll tell you why it's awesome but not unexpected that there's that many starfish here. Starfish's favourite food are mussels and this pier is absolutely covered in mussels. These starfish don't look like they're moving very fast or moving at all when the tide is out but wait until the tide is in and these become voracious predators of mussels. This is a gross but my one of my favourite sea life facts. Mussels will 
have really strong muscles so they stay clamped shut like that so a starfish will use its very strong arms to pull open the shell just a little bit it will puke its stomach out of its body into the muscle and slurp it up like a smoothie so really what we're witnessing is these gorgeous starfish here just having a nap before going on like a smoothie spree <laughs> A quick note on the rare sponge, <laughs> I have no idea if I managed to find it. I only bumped into Matt in passing and forgot to write down the name, so I found out the name afterwards, it is Siberti's Massa. Oh, so I'll just have to visit again, what a shame. And uh, with someone who knows what they're talking about, I'm gonna go find that sponge. <laughs> the rock pulling at the spot was actually really quick, I only had about an hour, and because the visibility in the sea was so bad, as soon as the seawater touched anything, you couldn't see anything at all. I headed slightly further back to look to see if there was any any like clearer pools with any cool creatures in and wow what a find two adorable little baby corcoran wrasses these are so cute and could easily fit the palm of my hand <laughs> what an incredible little rock pulling session. I have never seen so much in about a 20 minute space that I have never seen before. Those amazing, they must be a type of Doris sea slug. That's the sea slug with Doris in the Latin name, so I call them all Doris because why would you not call something that looks exactly like, well, the epitome of a Doris, a Doris. Anyway, <laughs> I'm rambling. The weird cool sponge crabs, the baby scallops. I've never seen a world scallop before. Yes! I'm so excited about that. Um, the, but the baby wrasse as well. The baby wrasse is incredible. And I have a massive soft spot for wrasse because the first time I ever saw a wrasse, I was fishing with my dad and my granddad. And, um, and we reeled one in and I was just like, that is a tropical fish. Someone has, has let out their aquarium and then i discovered that these beautiful colorful gorgeous fish live here in the uk and i found that incredible and i and then went and did stuff like during my undergrad we went and helped judge a kayak competition so everyone goes off and kayaks at oxwich bay they catch all these awesome fish like wrasse and bring them back in and we help verify that they've caught the right species for the size for the fishing competition and that was awesome because there's lots of different types of wrasse so then i was discovering that there's not just this one colorful wrasse but all of these beautiful awesome species uh it's just so fun and then i've also been fishing before and seen wrasse and um then seen parasitic ooh, ice mm, copepods I'm gonna go with parasitic copepods. It could be an isopod, it could be something else. There's many different pods. There's amphipods, isopods, copepods. It's all about the shape and where they split into. Um, and I'll have to look back at the pictures. But I also found my first parasitic copepod on a ras. I am a massive fan of ras. And to see those cute little juvenile baby ras and the way they were behaving was so interesting because they were like, Oh, if you can hear music, by the way, there is a mumble triathlon just up the road and they're all just going to finish, which is super exciting. Go triathlon, people. Um, but all these little baby, cute little baby wrasse were like, the behaviour was that they're hiding around a rock. Some, some fish are skittish. They don't try and get away as soon as possible. And this was just to curl up on the side of a rock, which was, which was awesome and also made it way easier to film because they were just like, I'm going to stand here or sit here until you go away perfect <laughs> um oh this shore is just incredible now it looks like there's a lot of tide left this shore will come in very quickly and once you're past the lower shore here there is just lots of typical rock pulling stuff and i'm not saying oh typical rock pulling stuff elizabeth doesn't want to rock pull those i just don't want to put the effort into rock pulling them here because it is also quite man-made there's a lot of like glass and um, metal and stuff that I could hurt my hands on so I had to be very careful of that today uh, thinking maybe in the future gloves might be a good idea for this shore but I do like rock pulling and being able to touch and feel stuff it helps you ID things but it's just not worth it 
for like the stuff up here where I know I can come and find on other shores and it's very CBD so you'd have to like put your hands through stuff you can't see anyways me being super cautious which I encourage everyone to do um, and so I just sticking to like the lower shore stuff and I'm gonna head head to Mumbles Pier which is just over there for a cafe and I'm gonna get myself I think maybe a hot chocolate or a lovely coffee or something and watch the tide come in which is just oh fond memories of one I used to do this as a as an undergraduate and master's student it was just amazing um oh, there was something else I was gonna say what else was I gonna say hmm Maybe nothing else. Oh, yes. I usually, I don't really bring a tray or a bucket or anything to put stuff in because I don't see the point massively. I like to get pictures, videos of it in the natural habitat, see the natural behavior. But on this shore, I think in future, if you're ever rock pulling here at Mumbles Pier, bring a bucket, bring a bit of white tray and bring, um, like find a rock pool height, like, maybe higher up the shore or somewhere that's, that's clear and fill it up and then you'll be able to take creatures and put it in there to see them properly. Usually it's not this rough but there is a storm going on and the water is basically like the visibility is nothing. As soon as that water hits it you can't see a thing. It's also very silty so if you're turning over a rock you disturb the water and like immediately everything just goes brown so it's not even that you can't film here it's that you can't see it oh this has been an awesome video i'm so chuffed i went here today i was gonna think maybe i'd do bracelet bay again but i came here instead um which is an amazing choice i'm super super happy and now i'm super super happy that i'm gonna go sit in a nice warm cafe and watch the sea come in is there a more perfect day no that is the answer absolutely blooming not i'll see you next time for another video guys everyone bye